happy, happy Reformation Day. <laughs> I mean, you know, that sounds a lot better than trick or treat. <laughs> that is the devil. Let me tell you something. People ridicule it, okay, but Halloween is of the devil. Yes. There's no question about it. It's of the devil. And it's a celebration of evil. See, people think, that, you know, these witches are cute, you know, like... When I was a kid, there was a TV series called Bewitched, and it's the cutest lady, and she'd just wrinkle her nose and do all this stuff. And I, you know, we all thought it was wonderful, right? But that when I became a Christian, I realized how dark that really is. You know, when I, was a, when I was a kid in school, I used to think, man, I wish I could wrinkle my nose and make my enemy's pants fall down or something like that, you know? But that's evil, to want power like that over people without any moral connection to God that's totally evil and so uh, Halloween's evil but you know Halloween uh, Reformation Day that's fantastic I used to be Catholic and I thank God I found out about justification by faith through our Lord Jesus Christ one of the most basic and simple teachings of the Bible that's liberated millions of people and created modern the modern society that's currently disintegrating as we get away from it but 500 years ago you know Martin Luther went and uh, started a debate and thank God for debate right now um, if the modern ecumenical people would have been there at that time they'd have said now Martin you're so divisive just get out of here right but you know, in fact, I think the Pope called him a wild boar. <laughs> he prayed a prayer of, help, Lord, a wild boar is loose in your, in your uh, vineyard. But Martin Luther uh, was just the one that survived. You could go back in history to John Huss, our, our Czech town here, right? We celebrate Czechs. I used to go to St. Ludmilla's church, and everything was Czech. John Huss was a Czech priest who got the gospel. And that was before he had the protection that Luther was given by the German princes. And he stood up for justification by faith and he preached the gospel and he called out the Pope and the, the, the corruption and the, and the lies and they burnt him at the stake and he went gladly. He went praising God. Now, what a, what a grim subject, right? I can't imagine being burnt at the stake. And I don't think John Huss could have imagined but you've got to believe, everybody, that God will give us the grace for whatever we face. And the other thing we got to believe, which is what the Reformation teaches us, is that truth is worth dying for. That there's something worse than death. How about living a lie? That'd be worse than death. How about dying in your sins? That'd be worse than death. So praise God for Reformation. And I'm glad it came on Sunday. And it also... Um, I want to say that tomorrow uh, is the 41st anniversary of Believers in Grace Fellowship. So 41 years ago, we started this fellowship and uh, just a small group of people. And we all prayed and uh, really felt like we should have a church. And um, thank God, one, one of the things we prayed is that the light would burn all the way to the end. And I still pray that. I don't take it for granted. Many, many people started when we did and they're no longer around. There's so much stuff you have to overcome. You, you don't mind if I hold forth for a few minutes before I get to the Word? You've got so many things you must overcome. You know, the Bible says overcome so many places, especially the book of Revelation and the letters of John. Overcome. You have to overcome. And, you know, uh, don't let the familiarity of the language fool you. I mean, what's that saying? That's saying you are in a conflict, right? As a Christian, you are in a conflict. And you're called on to overcome, and there are different things that are presented. Like you, you got to overcome worldliness. You know, you got to overcome the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. You know, well, what's that mean? I've often elaborated on that. What is the core of our faith? That God became a man. What is the core of worldliness? That man can become God. Now look, it's one or the other, right? So how do you overcome the world? By really, really, really embracing the deep meaning of the incarnation. By saying, I can't become a God and I don't want to. I don't want to make my own rules and I don't want to have 
power over other people, and I don't want to be, you know, the God that I used to try to be. I want to go back to being a man, a sinful man indeed, but redeemed by the blood of Jesus, like we did today, a worshiper. I want to go back and become a worshiper. I don't want worship. And you got to overcome coldness. Remember, Jesus told the church in uh, Revelation, uh, Ephesus, he said, you're a great church. I mean, the doctrine is so good. You guys can tell false prophets and apostles. Your leadership's really bold. They're not afraid to uh, call them out and to confront the false. And that, that's a good thing, right? But he said, but I got one thing against you. You've left your first love. So you got to overcome this powerful coldness toward God that eventually becomes coldness toward each other. You got to overcome that. It's not a given. You're not always going to automatically love God and love your brother and sister, but you should. That's something that we got to overcome. Another church, he says, you love that one prophetess. She is the Joyce Meyer of her day, or whoever, okay. She would give you the word that would tell you, go ahead and commit fornication, and go ahead and compromise with idols. You're still saved. And you guys love her so much. He says, if you don't overcome following this false prophet, when, not if, when, I throw her into a bed of sickness and ultimately kill her and her children. You'll be there. How's that for gentle, mild Jesus? No, it's not a given. Like, oh, just hang on to all this junk and then we'll get to heaven someday and hey, maybe he'll show me if I'm wrong. No, he says, no, you overcome it. If you don't overcome it, it overcomes you. Worldliness, coldness of the soul, false prophecy, lies that people love to believe. These are things to overcome. I had to overcome uh, the spirit of Antichrist early on in this church. When I first was going to this church, some of my favorite teachers were Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin. And they had this teaching. Now, I never really did buy the teaching itself, but it came very close, uh, that we are all little gods because God is a God. And when gods have children, they're little gods. And that is the serpent's lie in the garden, <laughs> right? I had to overcome. I had to look at that and say that could not be biblical. I've got to break it, break away from it. And then, and then at 1 John, he gives encouragement to the people of his day. You have overcome the wicked one, the spirit of Antichrist, for greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, right? So there's many things to overcome. People have sinful habits they must overcome. You've got to fight them. Someone says, man, they always win. Don't stop fighting. I'd rather go to heaven still struggling with it than just, oh, well, what the heck? May as well give in to it. Uh-uh. No. Now, <clears throat> I got so into that, I forgot what it, Oh, yeah, now, now I know what I'm going to say. Someone asked me. Now, I don't want this separated from the message when it goes online because someone that listens to us online asked me if I would comment on Mark Zuckerberg's change of name of Facebook to Meta. What do I think about that? Now, I'm very, very technically uh, incompetent. But I do have thoughts about it that I will share anyway. And I hope that uh, they're of God, OK? Meta, OK, meta. Now, the first thing that comes to mind is that the Hebrew-speaking world was laughing out loud because meta is a word in Hebrew that means death, <laughs> OK? But Zuckerberg came out and said, no, I was talking about the Greek word which means beyond. Now let me just be succinct with this and tell you what I think this really is. Okay, we've got the universe, right? Universe. This is not a trick question. I go, right? Everyone's like, oh. No, I would never trick question you, okay? We have the universe, right? Have you ever thought of that word? What is the universe? It's everything that's created, right? Everything created, universe, uno, one, verse one word in the beginning God said let there be light the whole universe is one word okay but Zuckerberg's and his antichrist 
friend group. In their world, they want to create the metaverse beyond the universe. Let me just explain it as simple as I can without getting into too much detail, but a new reality. See, the universe is our reality. That's where we live with all of its ups and downs, right? And your whole life is your reality where God puts you and you've got to deal with reality. And I believe that in God's plan, he wants reality with all its ups and downs to eventually push you to turn to God. Amen? So that's the universe, right? But what if you could escape this universe and get into your own personally personalized metaverse? What if you could go beyond this reality? Let's say in this reality, you're not a very popular person. You're not too friendly and you're not too this or that or the other. But in the new metaverse that they're creating, uh, you've got an avatar that represents you. It can be very popular, very attractive, very, very, very celebrated. Everything you would ever lust for or desire in this life that you could be in the metaverse, right? So you, so it just, just as in, like I've been thinking about this, that was a great question, whoever asked that, and I'm glad you did. I've been thinking about how in my own life, how everything has so changed so radically, like for example, 40 years ago when we started this church, if we would have told, if someone would have told me, everybody, most people in the world are going to get on this something called the internet and reveal all the secrets of their life. There, there's no privacy, none whatsoever. Everything about them, even their breakfast, is going to they can't take a picture, put it out there. Everything who they like, who they hate, how foul mouthed they really are, all will be there. I couldn't, I wouldn't have believed it. I couldn't have believed it. Okay, and how hooked people can get on it, right? You can get hooked on self-disclosure and you can get hooked in the whole world of Facebook and you can get hooked in video games. Like games are fun. And like when I was a kid, we played games and we thought it was a big deal at Christmas if someone went out and bought us a Stratego set. Anyone here? Wow, man, fantastic. Like, we didn't get into the games. We didn't enter into the games. We just played these games that tested your mind. Or I had little green soldiers, you know, and I'd set them up and everything. But after a while, that just, you know, I was past that. Okay, so it's over. And so even Stratego is a limited appeal, okay. But in modern games, with the modern internet, you don't just play them, you go into them. And I'm, I'm telling you, you can go room to room with a, with a weapon of your choice and blow up anyone that comes, steps in front of you and everything like that. And look, everyone has to make up their own mind how they want to live their life. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but you should be cautious of it because basically what I'm saying is the line with Facebook and reality, that blurs the line of reality. So someone has no friends whatsoever because they would, couldn't be bothered to be friendly, but they have 6,000 friends on Facebook. <laughs> so if you have to choose between the universe that you actually live in where God put you and a new metaverse, well, you can be redefined. You can be whoever you want. Now, look, they were, they were describing what it's going to be like, what they're aiming for. Let's say you're walking down the street and you say to someone, you know, I need to buy a new pair of shoes, right? And then right, boom, a hologram of a shoe rack appears. I kid you not, this is what they want. You pick out the shoes that you want. You get, you know... And you give your number on a holograph of a card, and you don't get to pick them up right there because it's a holograph, but they get shipped to your home. In other words, there's nowhere you go in the metaverse where you can get away from virtual reality. Not, not what I'm saying is not reality anymore. 
Like in Facebook, some people are already way past reality. That's their life, their whole life. That's their social life. And that, that is uh, they're all measured in likes or dislikes or whatever. That is a reality. But this is, takes it a step further. In games, some people will never, ever want to leave games. They cannot even find truck drivers, for heaven's sake. And yet the government sent them out checks. I, I think the part of that might be because they want to get us all hooked on something which is much easier to control than responsible, independent thinking adults. They don't like the universe anymore. They want the metaverse. Now here, the metaverse, now I, I've done a bad job of describing it, but basically what I've been told is the metaverse, their aspiration is to take those two earlier steps one step further. Not just games and not just social media. The whole a whole new, and by the way, heavily marketed world. Much more to your liking. Now, you think there's going to be any room in that world for repentance and faith in Jesus? <laughs> well, there will be probably a, an avatar of Jesus, but he, he won't be. See, see, this is this is where it's going, and I'm not joking. This is setting us up for Revelation 13. It says they gave life and breath to the image of the beast that all men would worship. See, see, the thing is, like, what strikes, strikes me is the blurring. Now, I use Facebook. I love it. I use it for keeping in touch with people. I've gotten back in touch with people I had seen years, and I use it for preaching and sharing articles and things like that. It's fantastic, right? I love Facebook. But the thing is, like, if you don't watch out, the reality and that can, the line between them gets blurred. And for some people, that is much more preferable to the cold, hard reality. Same with games. Like, is the game ever going to end? For some people, the game never ends. I mean, some people, it changes their whole personality. I mean, how, by the way, many, many, many years ago, when they first had shoot, school shootings, someone said on radio, I was listening to talk radio late at night, and he said, well, they couldn't figure out why someone would take a gun to a school, go from room to room. And one of the things they said is, now how can they do it so calmly? Like they're not, like if, you, if, you, like if a normal person wants to shoot someone, you're going to be so nervous. Even if you've got a good reason to shoot them, I mean, you're just going to be bobbling, sweating, and just shaking. Your knees are going to be knocking. But they said, these school shootings are so calm. It's just incredible. How could that be? And one guy who was an expert said, well, I know exactly what this is because we developed these programs. We had a problem in the military. People, even in war, didn't want to necessarily shoot another human being. So we wanted to give them as realistic an experience as possible through technology so that they could just go calmly from room to room. If anyone pops up, boom. He says, these kids in these school shootings, and this was way back in Columbine days, they're actually living a video game. And I believe them. Now, it doesn't have that effect on everybody. OK. If you want to keep on playing video games, you go for it. But know what you're doing and know, know that you do not want to blur reality from uh, something else. And the, the, but then the metaverse, so he's changing the name to meta. Now, part of it is that he wants to erase the sins of Facebook because they're very, very bad. They're really naughty. And I don't have time to go into it, but they stole an election from a, a free country. I mean, it's, this is heavy, really. And they knew it. They knew they could. And they silenced the debate, uh, half a debate. How would you like to have a debate where only one side gets to present their side? Facebook does this on vaccines, on politics, on everything. They're so got it's such a bad name. By the way, the original name of Facebook, according to them, is that it was at Harvard and it was to, to rate girls. Rate, R-A-T-E. Oh, that's a pretty face. Oh, that's an ugly face. Oh, that's a pretty face. Oh, that's an ugly face. And they'd vote on how ugly or how pretty someone is. It's very, very calloused and inhuman, right? And so they want to get rid of that name, and I, I, I would too. I mean, seriously, but meta? Meta is a reference to a philosophical and technological concept called the metaverse, which in my view, and I'm sure many others are probably 
already starting to comment on it publicly, is going to pave the way for the beast and the worship of the beast. If everybody's, you know, <laughs> in this new fake reality, you got your, your new person, your avatar. You could be a new person. What's the Bible say? You must be born again. Well, what's the metaverse say? Well, you could just have a new avatar, and he's, can, he can be a lot better person than you are, a lot more popular, a lot more loved, a lot more famous, maybe a lot more violent than you could ever get yourself to be. See, it's virtual reality. It's the blurring of the line. And another thing, it's the blurring of the line, and I can't go into the detail of how, but this is perhaps the scariest of all, between machines and your brain. Okay, see, they've already <laughs> conditioned us to talk to a voice, Siri, and to ask questions. <laughs> Siri, what's the temperature? Siri, what time is it? Siri, uh, what is the meaning of life? <laughs> <laughs> and she's probably got an answer for all of it, right? You think Jesus is a real prophet, Siri? How about Muhammad? It turned out some people did that, and they found out Siri believes Muhammad is a real prophet, but Jesus is not. There you go. Metaverse. 666. And don't think that they don't already functioning that way already where they make the whole world into a virtual world. And not everybody, but some people, so, so vulnerable, so susceptible, that they will lose the difference. Actually, they'll prefer the meta world, right? Because, uh, well, the meta, the meta world, and, and I, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to close. The meta world makes no moral demands on you other than the new morality. You've got to be open-minded. You've got to be pro-gay. You've got to be pro-abortion. <laughs> Those are the moral demands of the meta world. Whereas the real world, I mean, God gave us the Ten Commandments. You think the Ten Commandments can be posted in the meta world? I don't think so. There's no room for repentance there, believe me. And there's no room for church. By the way, so many people checked out of church as of COVID. I'm not just talking this church. I mean, this church, they checked out for a lot of reasons, but overall, church is actually dying. Now, we're not going to die. We're going to live, right? God gave me a verse. I shall live and not die and declare the good works of the Lord, Psalm 118. We're not going anywhere, we're not gonna die, but I'm just saying in general, like let's, let's say you're into experience, and you like concerts, and you like fun, and you like humor, and you like comedy, and you like uh, emotion, and you like to be manipulated, and a lot of people do, that's the, that's the appeal of movies, right? Well, you think church could compete with that? <laughs> There's only one thing that you, get, you really got to like in order to really be committed to a church. You got to love the truth, Amen. period. Like, you know, like I, I personally, I love this table. Now, it's not elaborate, right? And it's not a big, fantastic show. I mean, even when I was a Catholic, we had a better show. I mean, it was fantastic. The priests would do the magic and turn the, it was unbelievable, right? R uniforms, candles, incense. You walk into a Catholic church, it's like going into another world, right? What's this? Do this in remembrance of me. Matt spoke of faith. What is faith? Simply remembrance. You know, everything in this world wants to make God and spiritual reality so dead to you. It's a soul deadening, toxic brew. And man, nothing like the internet can accomplish that. 
I talked earlier about how you know it was a standard practice. Now I'm really get, I'm really getting off my notes, but I'm going to do this. I think this is the Lord. Well, it was when I, when I was a first Christian, 1977, and you know it was just given. It was a a, a given thing. If you want to be a healthy Christian, you got to have a prayer life. You got to go inside so often go down to the sanctuary of God at the Assemblies of God Church and kneel down at that altar and pray and pray and pray. And there'd be other people praying and praying, and people come early to church and they'd be praying and praying and praying. And everybody knew that what you got to do if you really want to be a healthy Christian is you got to cultivate a prayer life. That's what seeking God means. The seeking God is a commonly used word in the Bible, and it means to cultivate a personal spiritual relationship with God. So everyone knew that. And everyone knew that you got to read the Bible, and you got to learn about the Bible. So we went down to... Christian bookstore, and I became a frequent flyer down there, and I just picked up anything that looked really good, and some of the stuff I picked up was absolute junk. Others was really quite good, you know, and I took on the study of Scripture, very serious, because I knew, you, you know, the Bible to a new Christian is your meat. What's prayer? Your breath. You're not breathing if you're not praying. Now, here's the thing that I want to say, though, and this is the sad thing about everything now, everything, the younger generation and all generations. An hour can go like that on the internet. <laughs> oh, man, that's a cool film. I want to see it. Oh, that, oh, and he's a comedian. I want to hear what he has to say. Oh, that's my favorite singer. I'm going to listen. You're just get distracted, right? And, 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 and an hour goes like that. Well, how is prayer ever going to compete with that, <laughs> right? The only way it's going to compete with that is if you personally have a revelation from God that you need God more than you need to be entertained. And I'm, I'm, I'm just dead serious. This is serious business. We had no idea it would be like this 40 years ago. And I'm so glad we stuck it out. And I'm so glad we made the adjustments we had to make along the way. And I'm so glad we fought the battles we fought. And I'm so grateful for what we have today. But we had no idea that we'd be facing these kind of things. An all-out satanic technological assault on everything sacred and holy. You can't have virtual communion. <laughs> Someone's got to hand you the bread and say, this is my body broken for you, right? You can't have virtual uh, the Lord's Supper. Someone's got to lift up the cup and in the name of God, bless it. And say, do this in remembrance of me, just like our Lord. Amen? So uh, now I'm not saying that our virtual congregation is, is not doing the right thing because they're with other people too and they're with us in spirit. But what I am saying is that the spirit of this age wants to supplant everything important and everything truly spiritual and truly valued by Christians and replace it all with entertainment and marketing and self-exaltation, self self-interest, and even coming so close. And this is what I think the uh, meta-universe, the metaverse is trying to do is what the serpent suggested in the garden. Look, you should be as gods. Now look, in this life and in this universe, we can't be as gods. Amen? Because reality hits us. So someone says, I, I don't believe in the law of gravity. Well, then just jump off that building. Let me see what happens here because I do, right? Reality will hit you. But in the metaverse, no. You want to be Napoleon? Cool. That's who you are. No rules. No laws against it. You want to be a man instead of a woman? You want to be a woman? They're already living that in the real life. I mean, the metaverse is already here in a sense. They're already going beyond the universe. But the universe, that's God's universe. Una, one, verse, word. Let there be light. Go to the book of Luke. Uh, I told you last time I preached on this that that'd be my last message, I thought. But then the Lord would not leave me alone. I got to do one more on this, uh, this beautiful passage. Luke chapter 10, 
verse 17. It's very curious. I was all set to preach something else about a month ago, and I woke up very early in the morning on Sunday morning, and this word came to me. It's just as clear as a bell that you should tread on serpents and scorpions, he said. You should tread on serpents and scorpions. Well, we're going to need to tread on some serpents and scorpions because there's enough of them, right? I have the feeling the metaverse is full of them, right? Wall to wall, serpents and scorpions. I mean, what's going to happen to people when they meet themselves out there in the metaverse? Their own avatar and their avatar is talking to them. <laughs> it'll, it, it'll happen. Luke 10, 17 to 70 returned again with joy saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Now I want you to stop right there. That is very, very powerful. And he didn't, he didn't contradict them. He didn't say, no, they're not. Now this, is, this was unthinkable in, in Bible times. I mean, the devil is, the, I mean, if you, if you ever notice it, the Old Testament doesn't even say that much about the devil. It says enough. I mean, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, Job chapter 1. He's just the enemy of mankind, the, the scourge, the bane, the accuser, the hater of Israel, the destroyer of nations, like Isaiah says. The, the, the devil is so fierce and awesome. God doesn't even really say that much about him because a person can only take so much knowledge without other things qualifying him. Now, he really opens up in the New Testament, talks a lot about the devil and his demons. And in this passage is one of them. And why? Well, how are we qualified? Well, it helps to be born again. Why does it help to be born again in dealing with the devil? Because the beautiful thing that Jesus did that we celebrated in that cup and that bread is he translated us out from underneath the power of the devil. And he put us on God's side. See, the power the devil had over us before is that God was against us. The devil's the accuser, right? You remember what Jesus said? Hey, you better agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way to court. What's he talking about? Your adversary's the devil. And what he does is accuse us. And the problem with a lot of his accusations is they're right. <laughs> You did do that. You're a bad person. Oh, I'm not so bad. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> and you're on your way to court. And the man, when the judge puts down the gavel, who's the judge? God. You think the, devil, the judge is going to throw the prosecuting attorney out just because he lo loves you? No. He's, he's a just God. He's a righteous God. You're on your way to court. There's a suit coming against you. You better agree with your adversary quickly. What's that mean? You better realize that where he's right, he's right. In other words, instead of saying I'm a good person, you got to come around saying, no, you're right, I'm a bad person. I'm really bad. I'm not as good as I used to think I was. God has given me a revelation of myself. I'm bad. In fact, a lot of people say a lot of bad things about me that from time to time. But the truth is, I'm secretly comforted by this one fact. They don't know the half of it. <laughs> I'm so much worse than they could ever imagine. That's what drove me to the cross of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus, which we just got to share. The blood of Jesus satisfies the... The, the broken law and the wrath that was against us expiates and removes our sins and put us on God's side. Now Jesus said in Luke chapter, or in Colossians 1, he said, he has delivered us from all of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. How many know that it's a beautiful, beautiful promise, right? You need never fear the devil. It's ironic. I'm, I'm preaching this over on Halloween. The devil, <laughs> praise the Lord, we win. I was thinking, is there any Reformation carols? And I could only think of one. A mighty fortress is our God. Amen. Anyway, uh, so, he, you know, Jesus said, uh, 
the, the, they said, Jesus, the demons are subject to us. The spirits are subject to us. This is great. I mean, th th there was nothing like that in the Old Testament where some believer had power over the devil. I mean, they're, they're so afraid that only God could protect them. And when, and when God removed his hand of protection, as he did with Israel, the devil ran rampant over them. Okay. There's a story about the David, David's census. Well, the, God had protected David from doing a grievous sin, taking a census of the people. But the sin was so bad in the nation that God just took away the protection. And David took a census and it brought the wrath of God on the nation so powerfully. But here in the New Testament, just normal believers have been sent out to tell the good news. And in the process, they come back marveling. Even the demons are subject to us. Through thy name. Now, how did they know the demons were subject to them? This brings up another subject. And I don't actually know how far we can get with this. But they knew because in the process of preaching the gospel, demons manifested themselves in people. They revealed themselves. Now, demons like to hide in people because what the devil and the demons want to do is estrange all men from God. That's really, it's that simple. That's the whole goal of the devil. He doesn't care how he does it, whether it be drugs, sin, idolatry, false teaching, the metaverse. I mean, he, all the metaverse is as a, a high-tech, ultimate, fait accompli, okay. But well, all the devil wants to do is estrange people from God. But when the disciples went out and preached the gospel, the light of God exposed these demons. And many of them, it's just like in the Gospel of Mark, in chapter 1, where Jesus went to a synagogue. And the next thing you know, one member of the synagogue, who probably went his whole life, they never saw anything or heard a peep out of him, stands and says, what are you doing here? What do we have to do with you, Jesus, son of God? Have you come to torment us? You ever think about that? I mean, do you think that's a normal behavior in the synagogue? I don't think so. The presence of Jesus forced one of Satan's scorpions out into the open. Through subterfuge, that old guy, that guy could have probably died and gone to hell. Sitting there a week after week hearing sermons from Moses. But he could have gone to hell anyway. There's a lot of people in church like that. But the presence of Jesus. And now Jesus gave them delegated authority. That's what it said. He sent them out and he gave them delegated authority. Go heal the sick and cast out the devils and preach the gospel. That's delegated authority. Now look. The only one that really has absolute authority over the devil is Jesus. He is the strong man that bound the strong man. And... Uh, he bound him so he could spoil his good. So Jesus has all authority. What does it say in the, in the Great Commission? All authority in heaven and earth is given unto me. Okay. Now the devil, the devil has his own authority. Jude said, be careful of false teachers who proclaim how powerful they are against the devil and brag about it. He said, their sin is presumption. What they're doing is speaking evil of dignities, glorious ones. What's that mean? Well, the devil. Well, the devil's not a dignity. He's an old slew, slew foot, and we just kick him in the rear end. No, that's the wrong attitude. See, I'll tell you something about the devil. The Lord uses him. And when the Lord's done... I hope I'm ringside and I have a bag of popcorn because he's going to get thrown into the lake of fire and I want to be there. First he has to go to the bottomless pit. But in the meantime, he's a dignity. He's higher than I am and higher than you are and higher than mo many of the angels. Now I'm going to give you another one. Now none of this I was going to say today, but it's all coming out. All right. Michael is also a dignity. And when Moses died, we're told that Michael and Lucifer had an argument over the body of Moses. You ever think about that? What, what could Lucifer do with the body of Moses? <laughs> if he incarnated the body of Moses, then Moses could come down and say, wait a minute. <laughs> 
those Ten Commandments, I got them all wrong. You should worship idols. You should. Aaron was right. You should worship the golden calf. That's a representative of God. See, if Moses, if Satan could incarnate Moses, then the whole nation would have followed him over the cliff. What's the Bible say? The blind lead the blind over the cliff. They go into the pit. They go to hell. But it says, now I'm quoting Jude. You read Jude you're on your own time. Jude's a fantastic little book. The Lord's half-brother. Jude says, when Michael disputed with Lucifer or Satan over the body of Moses, he dared not bring a railing accusation against him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. <coughs> now, I want you to think about this, okay? Now, one of the reasons why this is really important to you, whether you realize it or not, is because part of the Great Commission is, these signs will follow those that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. Someone says, I can't say I've ever done that before. Well, you might be in the future because there's a lot of them that have been let loose on this world. We are told in the last days that it will be a demonic time. We're told that. Now, I don't even like to talk about the devil. You know I don't preach about the devil all the time. But I can't ignore the devil. <laughs> it's there. <laughs> and they're astonished. Lord, even the demons are subject. Of course they are. Why? Because of delegated authority. It's not who Peter was, or, or Mark, or Matthew, or even Judas, by the way. Judas went out there and did that. You ever think about that? When Jesus sent his 12 apostles out, he said, go and heal the sick, and cleanse the lepers, and preach the gospel, and cast out devils. One of those was Judas. You realize the sin of Judas? That after all he saw, he's one of the ones that came back, oh, we can't believe it. the demons are subject to you. And he even came back after that, and eventually... The bottom fell out of his faith, and he went back to his master passion, greed, treachery, lust. And he's one of the few people who you could positively say he's in hell right now. It had been better for him if he'd never been born. <laughs> after, after that? After seeing all that? I know a lot of people like that. Miracles don't make you have faith. They really don't. Miracles are miracles. God is good. He's powerful. I prayed for people's healings that when they totally did, they got totally healed. I didn't believe it. <laughs> Mom and I went to India and we there was like a massive crowd. There was a bunch of us there as evangelists, like 10, 15 people. And we were on a high stage, and all these people in the dark. It wasn't all that. And they were all dark people, so all you saw was the whites of their eyes. And the evangelist said, go down in there among them and pray for them. And so we just lowered ourselves right into a sea of humanity. And we're talking to them through an interpreter. And I pray for one, and I go, in the name of Jesus, I don't even know what I'm praying for. All of a sudden, he's, the guy goes like that. He can hear. I said, what happened to him? He was deaf. What? I didn't believe it. Really? Are you kidding? And she did that with a little boy. She moved his legs up and down. She didn't even know what was wrong with him. But they put a, she didn't go down in the sea of people. She had the sea come up to her. So anyway, they brought a little boy up and, he, and, and his mom and dad. And she picked the boy up and she moved his legs <laughs> like that, put him on the ground. He started running around like a little kid would. And her mom and dad broke down in tears because he had been lame his whole life. And there was many other things. like, And I, I never talk about it too much. I don't because I myself didn't believe half the time. Or I fought with unbelief within myself, right? I'm like, really? Was it really like, that guy was really deaf? Really? But one thing, too, there's many, many demon-possessed people because there's many, many idols. And wherever you have idolatry, you have demon possession. See, it's not easy to get a demon possessed, thank God, but there are ways to do it, okay? And so when the, we would uh, have the glazed eyed people and we'd cast Satan out in the name of Jesus, and the first thing they'd do is take off their fetish. You know what a fetish is? They'll tie a little string around under the instruction of some kind of a pagan priest, and that's an ownership by the, dem the demon that they sought help from, the spirit. 
And so they just ripped that fetish off, which is un, 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 I mean, unbelievable to the people that knew him. No, no more demonism. They're free. Okay. And my, we saw a lot of that, but I don't talk a lot about it because I, I was stunned myself. It's not even like I experienced it. We just looked at each other. Really? Is this really happening? And the people were rejoicing and they're crying and they're, you know, it's just unreal. And some of them were Muslim and some of them were Hindu and then they became Christian. And I just said, no, this is too easy. <laughs> it couldn't be. What? <laughs> but it was. And guess what? We're nobody. It's delegated authority. Jesus has delegated his authority to his church. All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. You go, therefore, and preach the gospel in all nations. Delegate it. That means I'm the delegate. That means it's as though Jesus himself is standing there, if I'm standing there, in his name. These signs will follow those that believe in my name. They shall cast out demons. Now, Jesus goes on to say, don't rejoice in that. Don't rejoice in that. And we saw one time in the church what happened to that. Not in this church, but in the church at large. It became the occasion for my first book. When there's a lot of teaching about demons and casting out demons. And people went crazy. And they began to see a demon behind every bush. And they began to have something like the Salem witch trials. <laughs> I remember one guy was really into it. He was a friend of mine. He's an older man. And he one time remarked to me, uh, you know, Bill, anytime anyone has a demon or gets around me, then they start yawning. And you know what? He planted that thing in my head. And I had to fight so hard not to yawn because I was afraid he was going to do some kind of an exorcism on me. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I wanted to yawn so bad. I was almost crying. But that's his belief system. I mean, he went to this place in Chicago, which is ironically called Hagowich Baptist Church. And man, you talk about a lunatic asylum. I saw a film of it where the preacher gets up and says, all right, brothers, lock the back door because we're going to do some deliverance here. And so they locked people in the room. Big old, <laughs> big old cross bolt like on a castle or something. And then his whole theology is that everybody has millions of demons and you'll never get rid of all of them but the best you can do is get cleaned up here and there and then he began to go through lists call uh, where of things that open the door so if your grandmother was a witch you need deliverance if your great-grandmother was a lit witch you need deliverance if your great-great-grandmother was a witch you need deliverance what if you go back four generations? You need deliverance. What if you go back five? You don't. <laughs> because the fourth and fifth generation, right? And then if you're wearing earrings, I mean, it's absurd. If you have tattoos, you need deliverance. I mean, on and on this list went. It was just crazy. And he went through this whole thing. And as he would do it, when he'd get on the things that people thought they had, uh, demons over, they would just begin to manifest right there. They'd just wiggle on the floor and slide down the chair and I mean their heads would start throbbing and they'd send people out to pray for them. It was absolutely insane. And I, I could, I don't want to exploit it, but I mean it was, it was so absurd, but I'm not going to give all the detail. But basically what that is, is the total denial of the sufficiency of Jesus' cross. See, here's the thing. Here's how it works. Jesus died on the cross, and like Colossians says, he delivered us from all the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. That is true, and that is true of you if you believe in the cross of Jesus, right? Now, what if you believe in the cross of Jesus, and Reverend uh, Demon Chaser comes to town and has a big crusade, and you're sitting there, and he plants this idea in your mind that you aren't free that you might have a demon because you got a tattoo in seventh grade and you smoked a joint in eighth and now you wear earrings now look the thing is d demons operate under the power of suggestion of thoughts 
Now, do I believe a Christian could ever be demon-possessed? I don't believe a true Christian could be demon-possessed. But I'll tell you what I do believe, is that a Christian can be what the Bible calls demonized. Like you, you get this thought planted in you. Wow, my grandma was a witch. That's scary. That's spooky. It's just like the Salem witch trials. Oh, man, did you hear that little fortune teller told me that we got witches in the family and I had a dream last night about so-and-so and they're a witch. And I mean, it just spread. And this, this happened in the 80s. That's why I wrote my book, uh, Making War in the Heavenlies, a different look at spiritual warfare because I wanted to set people free from that. It's a denial of the sufficiency of the cross. But having said that, there are demons and there is demon possession and there are unsaved people that are subject to demons. Now, there's possession and there's demonization. Now, at no point in the gospel could we ever say that Peter was demon possessed. Okay, that would just be absurd, right? Peter was not demon possessed. He was a devout uh, Jew who did not worship idols and was, to the best of his knowledge, was consecrated to God. And then when he met Jesus, he was even more. And yet, Jesus looked at him one day when Peter tried to talk him out of the cross and he said, get behind me, Satan. Okay, no, Peter was not demon possessed. But Peter had come under the influence of a satanic thought. And that thought was, talk Jesus out of the cross. By the way, is that a reasonable thought? among friends, let's say you have a friend saying, I'm gonna to go to this city, I'm gonna be betrayed. You, would you not try to talk him out of it? It's totally reasonable. The, the, there's a warning in that. The, the devil himself is a camouflage and he camouflages behind human reasoning. And Jesus said, you savor the things that be of men. He didn't savor the things that be of the devil. He didn't say take a chicken's blood and sprinkle it in the sign of a swastika and then your war will go away. <laughs> no, no, he just said, look, Jesus, it couldn't be. Messiah doesn't suffer and die. He's not betrayed. And Jesus looked at him, get behind me, Satan. See, there, there are not a lot of people demonized, thank God. But there, I mean, there are not a lot of people demon possessed thank God. But there are many, many, many who are subject to the various thoughts and philosophies and whims and ideas and passions of the imps. You shall tread on serpents and scorpions. See? Now, another one that comes to mind, and that is that uh, Paul came to Europe. It's a great story. Someday I'll get into it. Acts chapter 16 was a turning point for all of our history. How many here of European descent? Okay. <laughs> Paul could have gone to Asia or he could have gone to Europe. Because he went to Europe, history changed. And in such a positive way for us. Although I know it doesn't seem reasonable. That's 2,000 years ago. Everything changed in Acts 16 when Paul went to Europe and not Asia. And when the Europe became the cradle of the gospel, and that's what gave us Western civilization, European civilization, which I believe, even though it's in decline now, was like the best civilization that you could ever choose to live in, okay? And that's because Paul went to preach the gospel to Europe. And so our forebears who used to paint themselves blue and run around the forest naked and get in fights with each other, they were no longer savages. Now, a lot of them were pretty close, but a lot of them became Christian, right? Now, when Paul went to Europe, though, it didn't, he had a vision. He had a vision of a guy from Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. Who's going to help us? And so Paul, you'd think if you're going to have a vision, it's going to work out great. So Paul followed the vision, and him and his team came to Europe. And when they got there uh, to a town called Philippi, there wasn't uh, even so much as a synagogue full of men. 
See, remember, Paul's, Paul's manner was to go to the synagogue first and then launch out from there, which is reasonable because the synagogue has the teaching of the Bible, of Moses and the prophets. So he'd go there and then he'd re reach out to the Gentiles. But there wasn't even so much as a synagogue. You know why there wasn't a synagogue? Because there weren't 10 Jewish men that were willing to form what's called a minion. The closest thing to it was a woman's prayer meeting by the river, which Paul went to. And then he began to preach. And one of the girls from that prayer meeting began to follow him around. And everywhere he went, she said, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they're showing us the way of salvation. By the way, does that sound right? I think that'd be right. I, if you didn't know any better, that sounds great. That's, yeah, right. Thank you. A little girl wants a witness. Praise the Lord. But every time she said it, Paul got grieved. He felt a check in his spirit. It's like, nah, something wrong here. But you couldn't go by the content. The content was right. There was something wrong. And then after three days, the grieving got so bad, he looked at the girl and said, I command you, Pythian spirit, to come out of her in the name of Jesus. And she was released of a spirit of fortune telling, the Pythian spirit. See, it turned out she was a slave. By the way, half of the Roman Empire was slaves. She was a slave. That was not the same as most people think. And her, her master made money off her by fortune telling. She had a gift of divination. But then she was attracted to Paul and the gospel. And when Paul cast the Pythian spirit out of her, she lost her fortune telling gift. And her master had Paul beaten and thrown in prison. The Bible's amazing, isn't it? He cast the devil out of her. Now, what would have happened if that devil never would have been cast out of her? If she would have died with that evil spirit living in her and practiced fortune telling for the rest of her life, she would have gone to hell. Salvation came to her. See, this is the thing that I want to re you know, emphasize. Salvation is so critical. People need saved. They need to be born again. This girl got born again and you, you think if you do a good deed then you're going to get a good reward but in this evil world no good deed goes unpunished. So Paul got thrown in jail and the guy wanted to bring a suit against him. You ruined my merchandise. You ruined my property. But then uh, when they found out Paul was a Roman citizen then they, they let him out. <clears throat> you see, the last thing I want to say, because I, I've gone in a totally different direction than I thought I would, but I do want to take, take us at one more aspect of this, and that is that, like, we live still in a very highly secularized world, and so uh, the whole thing about demons and devils, I mean, it's kind of embarrassing to people, even though it's real. It's embarrassing, so who wants to go and talk about devils, you know? You know that smile of sophisticated people. Oh boy, one of those, <laughs> oh shoot, Pentecostal. Oh yeah, they're into demons, you know? And so it's, 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 it's a powerful thing. Like I've seen the same thing in Africa, okay? Like you get kids from Africa and their whole world, even the non-Christian ones, is a nightmare of demonism. You go to a demon doctor, a witch doctor, and you have curses and things like that put on you. And, and then when they get saved, I mean, that's why the gospel's growing so fast in Africa. Way more Christians in Africa than in America, I guarantee it. And they're just so happy because, like Paul said, deliver them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to the power of God. That's real, right? But then when those saints, let's say that kid gets a scholarship to come to college here, they don't want to talk about that part of their life that they've seen because they pick up on the pseudo secular sophistication and they kind of laugh among themselves like oh this is embarrassing you know we, we, they, these people have no idea because they they lived in a world 
of magic, and I'm not talking magic in the good sense. It's a magical world in the very darkest way. So it is with us. Now, we, we're, we believe in God, and so to believe in God, you have to believe in the devil, and you have to believe in Jesus. Now, one of the things that helps me is this, is that I came to this realization, and this is why I couldn't leave this text alone, even though I told you I'd try to, um, is that look at, look at the way Jesus, as a man, he's the God-man, uh, handled the whole subject of Satan and his minions. I mean, I just quoted from Matthew 16 where Jesus quickly, you know, right away, just discerns Satan is talking through Peter. He's not ashamed of that. And he does something that was probably so shocking to Peter. He addressed Satan directly. You, Satan, get behind me. <laughs> Can you imagine the shock of Peter? Get behind me. You don't savor the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. And by the way, that's another point. You know that Satan is not necessarily a Satanist. Satan is a humanist. Not a Satanist. Satanism is, I mean, there are Satanists, but that's too blatant. He's a humanist. Oh, God, God wouldn't want his son to die on a cross now, would he? See, there's an Anglican bishop that used to be very popular as an evangelical in England named Stephen Schalk, who went, he went bad. And one of the things he began teaching is these people that believe in the propitiation, in the death of Jesus on the cross to satisfy the wrath of God, that is accusing God of cosmic child abuse. Okay, now look. That's a humanistic interpretation, not a satanic. That's humanistic, right? But it's satanic. Now, when he's with the Jews, he gets in a religious argument with the Jews in John 8. And I mean, they are supposedly the elite of the elite of the chosen people, the experts in scripture. These are the people that read. These are the people that knew. These are the people that taught and influenced minds. And he strips aside their veneer. He says, you are of your father, the devil. What? Oh, yeah. He could see behind their masks the hidden foe. And he spoke of the devil as a murderer. See, the devil's a person, and he's a murderer. Well, who's the first people he murdered? Adam and Eve. The devil murdered Adam and Eve. How? By seducing them into sin. He killed the human race. He's a murderer and a liar. Now, in the end, everything is going to come down to a, a wonderful clarity is coming. And it's going to come down to one of two concepts. One is called the truth. And the other is called the lie. See, there are millions of lies, aren't there? I mean, just any given day in Washington, D.C., I mean, hundreds of thousands of lies, all right? But underneath all the millions of lies is one lie. And it's the lie that says that man can be as God. Now, so it is with truth. There's a lot of truth. So is you talking about the truth of algebra or science or literature? Well, underneath all truths, there is one truth and that truth is that God became a man now you only got one or two choices like this metaverse I talked about that is the lie we're gonna go beyond the universe that's what God made turns out the universe is pretty uncomfortable for a lot of people they want to see what's beyond it well the metaverse you can be like God. You can make your own rules. Believe me, whatever you want to do in the secrets of your heart, they'll find a way to let you do it in the metaverse. What, 
what happens if you look in the pit so long that you fall in, that you lose your balance? See? There's a pit, a snare being set for the human race. He says, watch and pray always that you be found worthy to escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man. For as a snare shall it come on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Now, there are some people so excited about every single advancement of the internet. They don't even realize it's become their heaven, their goal. Well, you know, <laughs> there's so much more I could say. Something natural that happened like a storm, but Jesus could perceive there's something behind that storm. So what's it say? He, he rebuked the storm. Now, normally storms are just storms. There's wet, bad weather since the fall. Yeah, but Jesus, there is a gift of the Spirit called discerning of spirits. Jesus discerned something beyond weather in that storm. Peter's mother had a fever. Well, fevers are fevers. Everyone gets fevers. People get sick all the time. Yes, but when Peter brought Jesus in, would you pray for my mother? He rebuked the fever. How, why? He had discerning of spirits too. A supernatural gift of the spirit that showed him the evil spirits behind the fever. Not all fevers. And <laughs> one other thing I'm gonna say, and, and, and that's, that eliminates like my list of about 40, okay. Jesus out in the desert talked to the devil. He talked right to him. It doesn't say he could see him. He might have and he might not have, but he certainly talked to him. But what he said is really important. And, I, and this is the last thing I want to highlight. See, because Jesus came as a man. He's the God-man. So what does the God-man, who is the word of God, what does he have to say to the devil? Well, when the devil tempted him, Jesus came back with this formula, it is written. And then he quoted an appropriate verse, which tells us several things. Number one, that the word was in his heart. I mean, he was actually living Deuteronomy 6, which he quoted. He's in it. He's out in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. Okay, So the word was in his heart, and he just drew on the word. And when he addressed the enemy of men's souls, the great adversary, God's adversary and rival, he said, it is written. He didn't lose his temper. He didn't abuse him. Remember, the devil's a dignity. He's a glorious one. He didn't uh, come up with some wild powerful, boastful thing to say. He just said, get behind me for it is written. And what the meaning of that in closing has so much to say to us. See, because you and I have a battle too, but we will not overcome unless we imitate Jesus and do exactly the same attitude and the same spirit and the same everything. So what is the attitude that says it is written? This is the attitude. I am not standing here in my own name or as uh, a powerful, mighty man of God, which there are. there is no such thing, by the way. I stand here under the authority of my Father in heaven. I'm a man in submission to God. I'm standing on the ground of that submission to God. And I'm citing my God and his authority. And the Bible says the devil had to leave. What's it say in the New Testament? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. God bless you all. God bless you, Cyber Church. Thank you, everybody. Praise the Lord. Let's have